Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined today with John Rabino, the one and only, the favorite. And I, John, I seem to talk to you after big announcements. I know we talked after Brexit and a number of other rate hikes. And here we are again. Uh, the fella just decided they was baked in the cake that they are going to raise rates and sure enough they raise the feds funds rate another quarter of a point uh first of all john thanks for coming on the show with me today sure kenneth and good timing yeah <laughs> the fed <laughs> just acted what a half hour ago so we've got a lot of fresh things to talk about here it's great well it was baked in the cake and this is the third one in 11 years. Not really, really not that many. And uh, it's a, a really weird turn of events when you think about it. About it. When the Fed was slashing rates, uh, gold was going down, which was counterintuitive to a lot of our thinking, my thinking at least. And here we are with Fed raising rates, you know, starting in 2015. And that was essentially the bottom for gold. So uh, just... What are your thoughts on this in general? Well, I, I think there's there's not a one-for-one one relationship between what the Fed does and what gold does, because you have to take into account what has happened in the past. And um, Egon von Greyerts, a, um, a, a Swiss gold dealer, just published a chart that I, I was looking at before you called that shows the, um, the relationship between the gold price and U.S. government debt. And for the entire decade of the 2000s, the two went up in lockstep. They were really closely related. And then in uh, 2011 through 2013, gold went way up. It just it exceeded the amount of government debt being taken on by quite a bit. And then it plunged. So whatever the Fed was doing during that time was less important than the fact that gold investors had gotten very excited and then very pessimistic. Mm. And for reasons that are within the gold market, you know, the price spiked and then it tanked. Um, and that's that's really a technical thing that has little to do with what the Fed is doing in the moment. So we said that we're, uh, we're getting inflation now, you know, that's and they yeah. they're getting confident with uh, raising rates in the face of debt, you know, all this debt that we've been dealing with. And, uh, you, know, what, you know, give us your thoughts on that, you know, with their, the direction they're taking the rates and what we got a, in front of us. Yeah, well, now, now we're at an interesting point because it's familiar. <laughs> we, we've been borrowing huge amounts of money for the past seven or eight years, trying to lean against all the bad debt that was taken on in the previous 30 that caused the Great Recession. And it's been a slow process of basically refinancing all the terrible paper that was out there. Uh, and it wasn't working. Uh, by the beginning of 2016, the world seemed to be heading back into a deflationary crash. So the, the world's governments basically stepped up and started borrowing even more. You know, the, uh, the U.S. borrowed a trillion dollars at the federal level. Uh, the European Central Bank created another trillion euros and handed it to the banking system. The Chinese banking industry wrote $1.8 trillion of loans in 2016. So a huge amount of new money hit the market. And finally, it's having the expected Keynesian impact. You know, the economies of the world are picking up and um, employment markets are getting tighter and inflation is starting to exceed central bank target levels. And some of that is just oil going back up, but a, a lot of it is also all that money that was created and dumped into the market is being spent. So it's making the price of a lot of things go up, which is the popular definition of inflation. But so, um, you, you have to look at what we had to pay to get this. So, you know, a Keynesian might say, well, we're OK now because aggregate demand is rising and et cetera, et cetera. You know, the economy is growing again. But we had to pay, let's say, five trillion dollars to be conservative to get this little pop in growth. And now we got to do something with that debt. So it's the same story of basically the past 40 years where we've been borrowing too much for what we get. And then that debt is piled on top of the mountain of debt that we already have. And we have to borrow even more to get what we think of as a normal economy. Um, and uh, I would 
argue that we're close to the point where no amount of borrowing is going to make any difference. And then we've got the giant financial crisis out there that kind of that your listeners know is coming. Mm. And we just don't know when. But it certainly feels like we're, we're reaching the point where um, th- there's not going to be much left to do with the um, existing set of tools in the, the Federal Reserve's to- toolbox. And that uh, the final reckoning is is at hand in the next couple of years. John, is, is, should it be seen as a red flag that gold is up in the face of a rate hike, at least for Keynesian and the, Keynesians and those who think that we're in a good spot right now? Well, it, it could be just a, a relief rally. In other words, the Fed didn't raise by half a point and they didn't say any really horrible stuff in the, um, the, the announcement. And so we're not in an immediate aggressive tightening cycle. You know, they're still being gradual and maybe gold traders just decided that was good news relative to what could have happened. You know, it's not the worst case scenario. But um, again, see gold should be $5,000 an ounce. So on a day when it goes from 1200 to 1220, it's hard to read a whole lot into that just because it should be way higher. And the fact that it's starting to creep in that direction is just something that should be expected. We just don't know the timing of it, but we should expect the general trend in real assets like gold and silver to be upward, occasionally aggressively upward, sometimes um, just a, a, you know, little tiny move. But in general, we should expect gold and silver to be rising in a world where Central banks are completely out of control. You know, governments are running big deficits. Central banks are creating huge amounts of currency and just dumping it into the market. So you would think all real assets ought to be rising in a general way right now. And so that's that could be this. You know, that could just be uh, gold behaving the way it ought to behave finally. <laughs> so, that, right. you know, there's no real way to know what a day-to-day move means. Um, I think that... Um, the Fed's motivation is important here because they aren't necessarily looking at an economy that they think of as overheating. I think to a Keynesian economist, this is probably the start of something that ought to be allowed to run for another two years. You know, the typical Keynesian would probably like to see 4% inflation for three or four years to get us out from under this debt. Um, but the reality of it is that even 2% inflation is really destructive mm. of, uh, uh, of real value in the economy. And so what's happening now from the point of view of the Fed is that even though they would like to continue with this, they recognize that they need ammunition for the next downturn. And so Janet Yellen would like to raise interest rates in order to be able to cut interest rates when the next recession hits, which could be soon. You know, this is a, an eight year long recovery that we're in now. That's longer than normal. Mm-hmm. So the end is probably pretty close just based on historical trends. And the Fed would be naked right now if there was a recession today, because even after this last increase, short term rates are still one percent. And that doesn't give them a lot of room to cut dramatically in order to lean against um, a, a gathering recession when the time comes. So they would love to get the Fed funds rate up to three or four percent. Right. And not because they think the economy needs to be restrained today, but because they want that ammunition out there, because otherwise they, they're not sure what to do, because in, in a lot of the world, interest rates were negative and still are in some cases. Um, I want to I want to touch on that right there. Yeah. Um, okay. And that is uh, how this is going to impact other countries, and what are the rates looking like, and the trend of the interest rates around the world. Here we have the U.S. raising rates. What's going on elsewhere? Well, elsewhere, monetary policy is still pretty easy, because, for instance, Japan and Europe are still in a really deep mess. There, there's nothing happened lately that um, that allows them to think that they're getting out from under their problems. So they're still aggressively easing one way or another. You know, the European Central Bank is buying back tons of bonds and pumping the 
the resulting euros that they're creating into the banking system. The Japanese government is still running massive deficits and the Japanese central bank is still financing those deficits. So in effect, money is very easy in those two systems. Now, their interest rates have gone up a bit lately just because global interest rates have gone up. And that's tightening, but that's the market doing the tightening, not the governments. They would still like low interest rates and they would like weak currencies. Um, what's changed from their point of view is that now the U.S. kind of wants a weak currency, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, for the last couple of years, we've allowed the dollar to go up, which is the same thing as saying we've participated in the decline of the yen and the euro in order to help our trading partners because they were in worse shape than us. But now that has, has kind of run its course. We, we've elected a new president who isn't happy with the impact of a strong dollar on U U.S. industry and would like the dollar to fall. You know, he doesn't say that in so many words, but if you, you know, parse his tweets and things like that, it looks like the executive branch would like to engineer a lower dollar. And that's an existential threat for Japan and Europe. So they're not sure what to do now because Japan has borrowed insane amounts of money and is continuing to do so and, and hasn't seen anything from it. You know, it hasn't um, achieved anything other than avoiding a depression. Europe is falling more and more deeply into debt year after year after year, and its periphery countries can't keep up with Germany. So they can't have the same monetary policy, um, one to suit Germany um, and one to suit Italy. Those are two very different things, and you can't run such separate policies with the same currency. So Italy's bonds are starting to spike now, their yields. They, uh, Italy was able to borrow money for about 1% a year uh, for 10 years, a year and a half ago. And now that yield is up to 2.4% last I looked, which means that their borrowing costs are going through the roof. See, and, and that's an existential threat to the Eurozone and to the EU because Italy can't function if their interest costs go up because they're already borrowing way too much money and rolling over a lot of money. Mm. Europe has a lot of problems like that. So either one of those systems, Europe or Japan, are potentially the catalyst for a global financial crisis in the year ahead. Uh, and to an extent, I think the Federal Reserve knows that too, which makes their situation really confusing. <laughs> you know, they've yeah. got all these cross currents. Um, they want higher interest rates, but they're afraid higher interest rates will cause a global financial crisis. Um, so they're gonna raise interest rates a little bit to see how that works. And then they'll try again a little bit. They, they would like to inch their way up to 4% or so in the Fed funds rate. But they're afraid they'll never get there because the system will fall apart before that. But they're going to try. And so at some point out there, they're, they're going to do a rate increase that isn't received the way today's is. It's going to be received as, as a threat by the financial markets. And then things will really start to spin out of control. So I, I'll go out on a limb and say by this time next year, the Fed's going to be cutting rates. Wow. And the U.S. in general is going to be easing really aggressively because the world is so stressed out. You know, you, it, they'll be looking at Japan maybe teetering off the edge of the abyss and, and Europe spinning out of control because populists are winning elections or at least contesting elections really seriously. And that's threatening the stability of the common currency, yada, yada. You know, you know that story. Your mm -hmm. listeners have heard that before. But we're, we're getting to the point where it's not just speculation anymore. It's reality. And so that vastly complicates monetary policy for the Fed and for the Bank of Japan and for the ECB and for the People's Bank of China. You know, all these central banks that have gotten away with, frankly, crazy monetary policy up till now, because all that extra currency they've been creating and throwing out there has prevented a crisis. Now their policies are going to start causing the crisis in the future, because e either because instability is going to force them to aggressively ease or because a continuation of what they're doing starts to spook the markets. In other words, just staying the course from here could lead to a currency crisis where there's so much money sloshing around in the system that people start to lose faith in these fiat currencies and start to sell them off. And, and so it wouldn't even necessarily take anything aggressive by the world's central banks. All they have to do is keep on keeping on for the system to spin out of control. And, you know, I wouldn't want to be a money manager trying to uh, to manage portfolios where you're judged on a quarterly basis in this world. And I really wouldn't want to be a central banker either, because uh, 
they're operating with models that don't work anymore. Right, right. So they, they must have trouble sleeping at night just because of all the uncertainty because they're, they're old certainties no longer work for them and they don't have anything to replace them with. So the, these guys suspect that they're going to preside over a gigantic crisis in the not too distant future and they're, they're going to get blamed for it right. <laughs> and they don't know what to do. So, you know, it, on the one hand, it's easy to think that they're just getting what they deserve for their l- career of incompetence. And on the other hand, it's, it's easy to feel sorry for them because they're, they're academics who, whose models don't work anymore. And there's not much sadder than that. Mm. John, I want to get your thoughts here. And you use this phrase in your last podcast, and you, you, you said that political hand grenades are going to be thrown into the mix of global financial markets. You said something to that extent. And uh, I just wanted you to expand on that, you know, briefly. I know you kind of touched on it, but, you know, what, what do you expect to happen in Europe? And is this a good sign, in your opinion? Is, is this going to potentially uh, bring down the establishment that has created this mess in the first place? Or is it just all part of everything coming down and who knows where it ends up? Well, political turmoil follows financial mismanagement usually. And the the developed world has mismanaged its finances since the 1980s or the 1970s, depending on what start date you want to use. So it's not a surprise that politics is getting crazier and crazier because more and more people are starting to figure out that the financial system is rigged in favor of the 1% and to the detriment of everybody else. You know, we all feel like we're being harvested by the big banks and by the hedge funds and by the multinational organizations, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and and so when you have somebody like Hillary Clinton standing up there saying, you know what, things are basically okay. We're going to continue the policies that are now in place. She's not speaking to you anymore because maybe you just lost your job because your factory moved to China mm. or maybe your neighborhood is, feels like it's being over, overrun by people who just wandered across the border illegally. And, and so your life is changing in dramatic ways, dramatically negative ways, and they don't seem to get it. And then when somebody like Trump here or Marine Le Pen in France or um, Geert Wilders in um, the Netherlands stands up and says, you know what, you're right, the system is rigged against you and we're going to fix it. We are going to take from the rich and we're going to give you guys. So that populist message suddenly, where it it didn't in the past, is, is suddenly very popular. People hear it and they think, okay, finally, somebody gets it. You know, they understand my life. And and in Europe now, every single European country has their version of Donald Trump or their version of Bernie Sanders, who wow. is generating a lot of votes. So every single election is this um, potential disruptor over there. And right this minute, as we're speaking right now, they're counting votes in the Netherlands in which the populist candidate, um, Geert Wilders, has a chance of coming out on top, which means then he would go into a runoff with the second place candidate for the presidency. Well, the the odds are still against him winning the whole thing, but they're no steeper than they were for Brexit or for Donald Trump. Mm. So there's an actual chance that an anti-EU, anti-Euro government could take power in the Netherlands sometime this year. And then a month and a half from now, the same thing happens in France. You've got Marine Le Pen, who's the head of a party that uh, that would pull out of the Euro zone and the EU if they take power. And, and she's tied for first or slightly leading the current polling in France. And those are the two elections that are nearby. And they're going to have everyone riveted for the next few months. But there are elections like that everywhere coming up in Europe. And it's just going to go on and on because... If the system doesn't change, then populism will become more and more popular. And if it does change, it will only change via a crisis because nobody in power gives up that power voluntarily. So the system either falls into a crisis and changes via some kind of huge crisis, or it goes on as is until the whole world is being run by um, versions of Donald Trump. And then everything is tossed up in the air, and we we don't know how that's going to turn out. 
but that's our choices <laughs> right yeah. there. The, those are the two things that, uh, that, that we have to look forward to one way or another. Uh, and, you know, either one is going to be pretty chaotic and is going to require a lot of thought on the part of the average person in order to structure their finances to protect them from something like that. John, I want to go back to the Fed here. And uh, we have the Fed openly purchasing bonds overtly. We, we know about it. It was the QE programs. Now, covertly, some say that they're already in the stock market purchasing stocks. And we know foreign central banks around the world are in the stock market and, and their local stock markets. Uh, you know, what is stopping the Fed from, you know, coming out completely and admitting to buying stocks and then maybe going into real estate and buying our homes two or three times their fair value to prop up the economy? And where is this headed? Well, see, this is why the Fed would like to raise interest rates right now, because they don't want to have to start buying alternative assets like stocks and real estate because it's an admission of failure. If you've got to do something extreme, that means the regular stuff you've been doing didn't work. They don't want to admit that. So they would love to be able to raise interest rates and have the ability to cut interest rates from, say, 4% to zero in the next recession and hope that's enough. It won't be enough. <laughs> you know, They'll have to do QE on a massive scale, but they'll find that they've bought back most of the bonds that they could have bought back. And then, then they're eating into like junk bonds and stuff like that. Uh, before they are able to stop the bleeding. So what will probably happen next time around is what has already happened in Switzerland and Japan, where the central banks ran out of bonds to buy and started buying equities. Um, Switzerland is a huge holder of um, blue chip stocks from around the world. They're one of the biggest holders of Apple stock and Microsoft, for instance, the Swiss National Bank. And uh, Japan's central bank, is one of the biggest holders of Japanese equity ETFs. And via those ETFs, they're major holders of a lot of big Japanese companies. So it's just a matter of time before the Fed and the European Central Bank are forced to do something like that. They might, might not do exactly the same thing, but they're gonna be forced to do something like prop up the equity market hmm. with public money. And I would argue that that's the end of the world when that happens from, from a capitalist standpoint. You know, when you've got the government being the major stockholder in the private sector, um, capitalism and free markets, as we have known them in the past, are over. So we shouldn't think this is a good thing, even though it would prop up our stock portfolios in the short run. You know, a hedge fund guy probably looks at this and says, okay, well, ideologically, I'm not cool with it, but it'll make me a fortune. So, you know, go ahead, Fed, buy stocks. Um, and, and it's tempting to want to just ride along with this bad policy and try to milk it, try to make as much money as you can from it. And maybe that's the best trade. But I think the, the long-term impact of having the government own most of the private sector, which is what would happen if the Fed bought enough equities to actually turn a deep recession into a recovery. Um, that would be a disaster on so many levels. And, and you know, uh, there might be some entertainment value. Imagine if President Trump woke up and found out he was the, the largest shareholder of General Motors or something like that. <laughs> you know, that would, that would be fun to watch. But um, it, it, would, it would be incredibly bad for a market-based economy because that's how wealth is created via markets. You know, when, when thousands or millions of individuals, each pursuing their own self-interest, make decisions about the allocation of capital, that capital tends to be allocated efficiently, um, at least relative to any other way of allocating it. When, when you've got government just randomly buying stocks, that hamstrings that process. So if we're going to shut down the market price signaling mechanism, um, because central banks want to buy 10% of every member of the S&P 500 or whatever, uh, then all of a sudden this wealth creation process that we kind of take for granted will just grind to a halt. You'll get something like Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged where capital goes on strike. Well, and then and you have the, the capital collapses. going. Let me just jump in. You have capital going to businesses that shouldn't be getting capital and maybe less capital going to businesses that deserve more capital in a sense. And, yes. um, and, and you have 
excess capital going to the biggest companies because that's how governments intervene in the uh, the equity markets. They're not going to buy small cap stocks. They're going to go buy the S&P 500 or the Dow or, or whatever. And that gives a huge advantage to the big companies who will then squeeze out the smaller competitors. They'll either buy them out or they'll, they'll use all this new money coming in to cut prices and run them out of business, whatever. So you, you lose the dynamism that comes from small companies eating the big companies from below. You know, that, that's how all the really good creative destruction happens in capitalism. You know, Google is started in a garage and it, it crushes huge sections of the economy by the time it's 15 years old. Well, that wouldn't happen in a world where governments are propping up the big companies relative to everybody else because then the big companies would just gobble up or crush the the future Googles of the world before they ever get started. Mm. And so you, you'd end up with, a you know, in a way, a socialist system where just big companies who are partners with the government are all that you have. John, uh, it, it was an incredible discussion here. Uh, just some closing thoughts. Yes or no on gold here <laughs> going forward. You, you like gold going forward here? Oh, I, I, well, I think gold is going to ten to fifteen thousand dollars an ounce within a decade, but I don't know what it's going to do next month. So don't ever put all of your money into something like gold or silver all at once. You know, you should be buying it a little at a time. You know, dollar cost averaging is always the best way to approach a market that is volatile and to an extent manipulated. So the long term trend is going to be up and there are going to be some amazing gaps up along the way. You know, we'll see some $100 days in gold and $10 days in silver, but we might also see them on the downside too. And mm -hmm. so you don't want to just jump in because some talking head on the internet said it's a good buy. You know, what you want to do is um, recognize that the long-term trends are in favor of real assets and against financial assets and start skewing your financial situation in that direction. In other words, take your dollar bills and then use them to buy gold and silver coins. Mm. Um, take your bank stocks, cash them out, buy a few mining stocks a little at a time, you know, do things like that and or pay off your mortgage so you own your home free and clear. And then over time, you'll be positioning yourself so that when what's probably coming finally comes, you won't be crushed by it, you know? You'll, you'll, you'll come through it in reasonably good shape, and then you'll have the capital to be part of the, the class that rebuilds society from the rubble of what we end up with. Hmm. Always well, so articulate. Uh, John Rubino, if you want more of him, uh, visit him at dollarcollapse.com. John, thanks so much for coming on the show with me today. Thanks, Kenneth.